My name is Ian and I'm a wedding and boudoir photographer. I also do wildlife and landscapes at times. I've been living in Euclid for almost 10 years now. I do the West Coast lifestyle, uh, surf photography sometimes, and uh, surf, art, children, beach. That's the life. <laughs> returning to Haida Gwaii and uh, we met some friends that live in town here Linda and Chris they said if you're going to Haida Gwaii and you're going to Tofino on the way stop and check out Uclule. Uh we rented a room at the Peninsula Hotel for two weeks and then uh, we rented a house and stayed and I have three daughters and they they've grown up in town so it's their community and it's become our world and I started surfing and now we're here We've always been an artistic family. Um, I was doing music in the past and uh, I did uh, photography with a manual camera uh, initially on film and in Nelson, BC in the Kootenays and there was like a teenage center there and um, there was a dark room, a skate park, all kinds of stuff. A friend of mine had a camera left from his father's when his father passed, he left all these things with him and he didn't know what to do with it. So he gave me this camera to walk around with. And I took uh, the manual camera out to the market and I took pictures of people, candid shots. And then the following week, uh, I went to the uh, the dark room there. And uh, the following week, I put the pictures on display. And people were very fond of them. And I sort of became a ph photographer instantly. I used to use disposable cameras like anybody. And I liked photography. But not till I actually used a real camera. It was a Pentax K1000. And uh, there was a really groovy musician actually at the, at the market. And he just looked different. He looked otherworldly. He looked like some kind of uh, Middle Eastern meditator guy. Like he was just so groovy. And he was having a coffee. So I just went up to him and I said, can I take your picture? This is literally the first picture I ever took. And he goes, what do you want me to do? And I said, just do what you're doing because you're so cool, right? <laughs> And uh, I sat back and I made my little adjustments. So that I, it was a mystery to me, but uh, I took the picture. And then when I went to the dark room and, and made the picture, I was just shocked. Like, I couldn't believe that exactly what I saw the image reproduced. And I, I just saw the magic right away of photography. I was like, that's incredible. Like, I sh captured how cool that guy was. And... Uh, yeah, I don't think he was at the market the following week, but uh, he never saw the photo. So that was the beginning of photography, but there was music, there was drawing, visual arts too. Um, visual arts, like something I used to do at that time was use pastels. Um, I would sit, I would go on, on the floor on my hands and knees and close my eyes and I would wait. And then as soon as I felt this thing, I would start drawing like crazy. And, the, and my sketch would take about I don't know, less than a minute for sure. And then I'd look at it and it's amazing. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but it's amazing what can come on. It's like, it's like stream of conscious, but instead of words, it's art and uh, drawing. I always thought of being a painter would be cool, but I never ever really had the patience to paint. So what I do with my images um, is I try to make it look like a painting. And often, like, one of the best compliments I can get is when somebody says to me, um, you're painting, or I saw your painting somewhere. And, but I try to put it into um, a painter's perspective so people look at the world differently than just I, a plain photo is, doesn't really appeal to me. To, to sort of summarize my technique when it comes to the wildlife stuff, like these ones that are here, is I'll take the picture and then I'll distort it and then I'll clean it up. So that gives me that painter look that I, in the, this one's a, pe a pencil sketch for kind of idea, so it's different, but you kind of, if you lower the contrast, it makes it look kind of like a watercolor, for example. And if you increase the contrast, it makes it look more like acrylic paint. Um, those are some basic ideas. That... I went digital not long ago. I went digital in 2018, I believe my first DSLR and then I was using the Lightroom rather than the Darkroom and so the Lightroom things are way more convenient 
what my technique is pretty straightforward. Like I wanted to, I take a picture of something with the intention of distorting it later. Sort of like you with your music, you take a, an acoustic guitar, but you're maybe writing an electric song in your head. You know you're going to distort it later. And so it's very similar. So I take the picture with the intention of creating something in post-production. If you look at the etymology of the word photography, it's like photo, so that's light, and graphy is writing, so you're writing with light. I was possessed by that idea, so when you have the film paper, this is how it works in my head. When you have the film paper, you expose the film paper to the light, the heat of the sun basically, and it burns the film paper, and what you do um, the art, the artistry or the technique of photography is you control the shutter speed or the aperture or the film thickness and as you adjust those parameters the sunlight will burn the film in a, in a unique way. It's a lot like your eye. So if you blink quickly or you blink slowly, if you keep your eyes wide open or you squint and uh, I guess the thickness of the paper um, it causes the strength of the color. Now on cameras we call it ISO. I don't even know what that means, but you can control it with the ISO. So because I was involved with literally writing with light, and um, you know I was young and idealistic, I was like, I'm never going digital. How is it even possible? <laughs> and uh, but then that I took a look at it again um, around 2017, and I was really impressed with the the cameras that were coming out after 2016 and I was like wait a minute I can operate this powerful machine exactly like a manual camera you don't have to use the automatic features you can always go completely 100% manual and so that's what I did and uh, it works like a charm and now I can use some of the automatic features if I want to but mostly I just don't so I still I use it in a way it's kind of escaping the dark room and uh, the toxicity of the dark room, which is something that I also hated. The chemicals that you like have to deal with. I mean, uh, the reason I was into photography is because I love nature, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you celebrate nature by being toxic? It's like it doesn't work. <laughs> so I was that was that was the problem there. And the digital stuff I perceived as as less toxic. <laughs> When I first came out here, I honestly thought the place was ugly. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah. I thought, what's wrong with these trees? <laughs> They're all gnarly and bent and windblown. And um, I found the weather harsh, stormy. The place is dark, cold and wet. And I just had a very like abrasive experience compared to, um, you know, the clemency of the Kootenays. Uh, there you've got snowy days forever. You could be chopping wood in the snow in the mountains uh, and in a t-shirt and it's peaceful and calm. There's no wind in the clouds. Stay in one place for hours. Yeah. <laughs> Here it's like the clouds are moving so quick. Yeah, it took me a long time to get acclimatized and appreciate the beauty of this place. The ruggedness, the rocks. I found it scary. When I started surfing, I began, I, you know, after a surf you come out and the whole world looks different, right? So, um, I began to see the beauty of the torrent because half the year this place is a torrent, right? I mean, the tourists come here in the summer and they see a beautiful sunny beach. They're at Long Beach and I, can, I love this place. I can live here forever. They have no idea what happens the rest of the time. So, it took me a while to, uh, to appreciate it. And without surfing, I'm not sure I'd stay here in the winters, honestly. <laughs> The trees that I didn't understand when I first arrived because of they're getting hit with that west coast storm. Like when you see them in the summer, they look a certain way, but uh, it takes a long time to understand what that tree goes through to become like that, right? So in that sense, I, I look at it in a whole new light now and I see the beauty of a, of a tree in that condition and I'll actually try to photograph the serenity hoping to show the torrent or I'll try to find some peace in a, like a landscape where there's a storm and then the, if the clouds just split for a little bit and let that sunlight through, so you, there's that indication. Like I do go for those kind of contrasts. I think this is a place of incredible contrast. 
I, I'm very humble and, and small and intimidated by this place. I, I know the wrath. I'm not, I just, my experience is very much an outdoorsman, right? So it's not like I'm sitting inside watching surf videos. I'm out there and I'm getting, I'm freezing when I'm taking photos and I'm getting my camera's gear is getting all wet and it's really rough. <laughs> it's not always as pleasant as it seems. Like I was out in the past the other day at a river and I was just, the wind was blowing and I was trying to hold my tripod still and my camera gear was getting soaked and wet and I was taking long exposure shots so I had to wait like three minutes just to take one picture. So I'm just standing there getting soaked. I'm like, this is not glorious, man. <laughs> like, it'll produce a nice image in the end, but it's like, I was literally like hunched in a ball in the rain <laughs> waiting. With a long exposure sh shot like that, um, because it's the shutter is open for three minutes long, the water blends. It looks so beautiful. And the clouds are moving quickly, so it looks beautiful. And then, for example, I just dropped off some postcards at West Coast Connect, right? And it's nice knowing that tourists will buy that photo and love this place and appreciate it. So that's why I do it, because I know in the end, I'm going to have this beautiful, wonderful, calm depiction of, of that river. And that's the goal. And that's how you have to, that's how you do it, because you, the truth is you cannot get that photo in the summer because there's not enough water in the river. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> so you must go when it's storming. Anybody who works with me in a wedding context, I always ask them to take a good look at my photos because I do think of myself as an artist first and I'm using photography and then they become the subject and the subject happens to be their wedding day, which is a big deal. So I, I ask them to understand first and foremost that you're hiring an artist. And then we talk, and I don't see it as different than wildlife or uh, landscapes or, I mean, out here on the West Coast, we have a wedding takes place in a beautiful landscape, right? So it's a landscape photo, but it's also a portrait. And uh, to me, it's very challenging because the conditions are always, there's so much variety. I mean, before a wedding, I'm checking tides, you know, that's a very West Coast thing. Like, I actually, I really like weddings. I think it's super challenging because you have, it's moving objects. You have targets that you have to hit, like the first kiss, the first look, when they get the rings out. Um, and working with people on a team like that, I, I like that too. I think a lot of photographers do weddings for the money and they kind of detest them and have a lot of bad experiences, but I honestly love it. People become incredible at incredible moments, and I get to photograph that. And on top of that, people dress up, and then people relax and party, and there's, there's so much variety. Wedding photos tend to go to a lot of people, um, family and friends, so I'll take candid shots, I'll take very clear regular shots, I'll take posed shots, traditional shots, and then I'll, I'll, I'll always ask them to do a little bit of experimenting too, if, if they're willing to let me. And then I do more creative things. Yeah, and then the boudoir ties into that too. Um, boudoir can be separate, but more often than not, in my experience, it's a woman taking pictures for her fiance as a gift or for her husband. And so it becomes part of the wedding package idea. When I'm taking the photo um, with wildlife, I'm always thinking only of the animal and of, of preserving what I'm seeing and supporting what I'm seeing. So I'm always thinking, how can I make um, for example, this hummingbird, this tiny little bird, this incredible little bird, how can I make this bird so big that for a moment people stop and consider its existence? And then by that, they consider nature and the world that sustains us and creates us. So that's my end goal always. Um, so honestly, when I'm taking wildlife, I feel a little bit, if I'm not doing that, I feel like a creep. Or a, or a peeping Tom or a reporter. Because basically a wildlife photo is a nude, right? You're taking this picture and then like, when, for example, when the, the newspaper wanted to print the bear photos, they wanted to know the location. I was very offended. I didn't, I just, why did I react like that? And I thought, I, cause then I'm totally creeping on these bears and exposing them, but they're in their solitude, right? So I said, I wouldn't give the location. I took a shot the other day and um, my subject was a man and I, he was kind of nervous at the beginning and I knew, I knew the light was good 
And I felt, I just felt that thing. And I was like, he was kind of stiff and I needed him to do something. So I said, can you take off your glasses? And I know he didn't want to. And then, so I made him uncomfortable and I, he was a little irritated, but it was deliberate. And then I said, can you put your glasses back on now? And, and then when he was putting his glasses back on, I called his name and then he looked at me. So his, and I went click and I just knew I got it. It's like, it's, it's, it's this feeling I get, like I feel it in my chest. And I was like, that was it right there. And I'm sure enough, the photo's epic, right? He hasn't seen it yet. <laughs> And I knew, like, all that stuff that led up to that one moment, it's that moment, and being ready for it. So you, it's really important uh, to have the camera set before that magic moment takes place, especially if you're doing manual, because you're, you're not going to rely on an automatic adjustment of exposure or whatever. So you set all the stuff, get the subject in place, and then what I do is I wait for the magic, and if it doesn't happen, I'll, I'll happily manipulate my subject. <laughs> <laughs> like that. They appreciate it in the end. In my experience, I prefer kind of being a farmer who sells his crops locally. And I really don't, I don't, I'm not that interested in expanding beyond where I am. So I don't make an effort to sell my art outside of the community, unless I'm in the community. Like maybe if I go to Coombs or I go to uh, Courtney or something like that, or where I meet people and know people, I find that's the best way for me. So I don't know how other artists do, you would know better than me. And, and the uh, Pacific Rim Art Society, does a, I, like, I love being a part of it. Um, what we have here that works really good is a huge flow of tourists with their eyes open. I mean, they want art. Visual art on the West Coast is a big deal in Canada and Canadian culture. Never forget the First Nations uh, history here artistically is just unparalleled, even during like the horrible racist and colonial times, um, the queen was like, when she saw the totem poles and the art from the West Coast, she was like, wait, <laughs> preserve that, don't just, we, th this is interesting, right? And so that, the magnificence of the West Coast art since, since that time has been impressive. And then we went into like more like modern times in Canada, the Emily Carr stuff, right? That's still so West Coast. And people have this idea um, that's why they come here, of what it looks like, and we're lucky. In a way, it's like a niche market for us, right? We're the ones creating here in the present. And so that's what we have, and then we have um, so many tourists coming here to see it, and they want to take a piece home with them. So we create it, and then an, an avenue for artists is getting their pieces into the resorts. And there's no end to that. If somebody's diligent enough, like if there's a, a an artist here that hasn't done that yet or is new or there's upcoming artists in the future, work with the establishments. If you go have dinner at a place, meet the manager, share your art, let them know. So we have that and we've got huge amounts of um, resorts and, and hotels that will put your art on the wall, consignment scenarios. It's just, if you want to be an artist full time here, you just have to be super productive and work. They say it's 95% work right I mean it sounds so obvious but when you work it generates success you have to work and you have to have something to give when you meet people they say what are you doing right I'm going surfing right or I'm working on this piece right now or I've created this thing or I was out in the mountains or I've got this like I've, I've just come back from this incredible thing and they want to see the photos in my case and then you show it and then a week later somebody requests that photo or they need it or use it for some reason so uh, that's how it works um, every year I give myself an animal this year I'd like to take a picture of a cougar last year was a heron the year before that was a bear and I'm, I've been lucky so far but a cougar is a, a tall order so maybe ask me if I, a year from now, if I got the picture of the cougar. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be sitting here in front of a picture of the cougar. <laughs>